Hi, welcome to Cascades Online. We're glad to have you here. I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God is never late Working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will Lift you up in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, yes, I will. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. He's working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. Without us, so 
Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. And nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. So death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil torn before. For you, you silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you, I raise to life again. And you have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Christ my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Hey, everybody, just a few announcements to share with you. The very first one is this. Our prayer walk is this Wednesday at 12 p.m. And I'd love to have you come and join us. We've been walking through our neighborhood, praying for homes, students, people working in the area, praying for our city. And it's just been a beautiful thing. So this Wednesday at 12 p.m., we just meet in our parking lot and you're invited to come and join us. If it happens to be raining, we're just going to move that onto Zoom and pray there. And so just make sure you uh, check out our uh this week at Cascades email and you'll get the Zoom link as well. Additionally, today, August the 9th, is our annual general meeting. We're voting on two things. One is our 2019 financial report, and two, we're voting in our elders and deacons for our board. If you subscribe to our newsletter, you would have gotten the financial report and our nominees, and you would know that if you're unable to come in person, we're actually making it uh, available for you to attend via Zoom. If you're a member, you'll be able to vote via Zoom, if you're not a member, you'll be able to attend and watch, but you won't be able to vote. So uh, if you're on our platform, you can click on the notes tab and there will actually be a link there as well to the Zoom uh, link. And so, uh, yeah, just bear that in mind. The only other thing to say is that uh, as a church, um, a regular rhythm of worship here at Cascades is giving. We give not out of a duty, but out of a, a, a delight because God actually has first given to us. He is the one who provides for us. He's the one who has sought us out through his son, Jesus. And we give a portion of what God has given for his kingdom here in our city and in the world. And I'm gonna pray for that right now. God, I give you thanks for your goodness to us, your provision. And I ask Lord that you would bless the monies that are given for your kingdom and your glory here in Vancouver and abroad. Give great wisdom to those who oversee it. Bless the giver and the gift, God. Those who at this moment who are unable to give, would you bless them as well, God? Provide work for them and allow our church to walk alongside of them. 
These things we pray today, God, in your name. Amen. Hey, at this time, uh, you're able to give through Tithely, uh, but additionally, uh, if you just want to chat on our platform, you can totally do that too. We should have a uh, great time doing that, and then we'll jump into our message. Hey, welcome to the teaching portion of Cascades Church Online. Today we're carrying on in our series called Fear No Evil. We're looking at those things that we would look at as the worst thing that could happen to us the things that we would actively just pray that never happen, that when we hear someone else go through, we just feel devastated for them. And so we're looking at stories in scripture where people experience this, where people are enslaved or falsely accused, people experience death threats, burnout, the inability to conceive, the loss of a spouse or a child, and even death itself. And in each case, what we're looking at is how they respond but more importantly, we're looking at who God is and what he does in those moments. And that's why we've called this fear no evil. Because even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as Psalm 23 tells us, we fear no evil because God is with us. And that's this common theme is that God is with us in it. He doesn't abandon us. And today what we are looking at is the story of Hannah. In the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you got a Bible, would you turn there with me? Otherwise, we'll just see it on the screen. And just as a heads up, some of the names are uh, these old Hebrew names, and so I'm going to do my best to read them, but you just bear with me, all right? Here it is, starting in verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoth, an Ephraimite, he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you eating? Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Father in heaven, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. May you be glorified. Would we experience your joy in this moment? In your name we pray, amen. Hey, the big idea is this, is that God, in him we have hope that he can turn our emptiness into fullness and that he can take the dead and actually bring it to life. Hannah is caught in this terribly sad situation where she's unable to conceive. And the reason why we're given like all those names of the ancestors of Elkanah is really to lead us to this point where Hannah's unable to conceive. So Elkanah goes and marries Peninnah and she has children. But Peninnah is jealous that Hannah is still loved. In fact, she's loved more than Peninnah. And so Peninnah mocks her and just seeks to make her life a living hell because she sees her as a rival. And so Hannah's in this place where she's deeply distressed. She's not eating. And unfortunately, Alcana, her husband, comes to her and says, am I not enough? He doesn't fully recognize what she's going through. This situation is tragic, and yet we know even today that many women are unable to conceive unable to uh, deliver to full term even. We, in, here in Canada, there are estimates that somewhere between 20, 15 to 20% of pregnancies end in a miscarriage. And some actually say that's on the low end, that it's probably closer to 25%, but that one in four women will experience a miscarriage. And the aftermath of this is this grief, sadness, depression, trauma, a sense of powerlessness, there was one study that was done by the Imperial College of London that found that four in 10 women reported PTSD symptoms three months after pregnancy loss. 
It didn't just happen and they moved on. No, this just went with them. Another study done in the UK surveyed 6,000 women and 85% of them said they didn't think people understood what they had gone through. They didn't relate to them. They didn't understand the pain they were going through. In, in this passage, we see how Elkanah is kind of in that place. He's not really understanding Hannah's grief and pain. And to make matters worse, she's got Peninnah mocking her, trying to make her life as difficult as possible. This is one, another one of those circumstances where we see Scripture pointing towards the problem with polygamy. In the Old Testament, it's not uh, explicit and direct and calling it out. In the New Testament, it is. That men are called to be husband to one wife, that women are to have one husband. Here we see the, the trouble with pursuing that. But notice that scripture and even her husband do not rebuke Hannah in her grief. They don't say, hey, why aren't you thankful that you have a husband, that you're not a widow? No, there's room here for grief. In fact, scripture gives us this picture of how we're supposed to actually deal with our pain. Hannah, though, the reason why she's so grieved is not just because she can't have a child, but because she actually sees this, having a child as a vindication. She feels like she's under God's judgment. Now, it isn't the case that every single woman in, in the Bible believes that if they're unable to conceive, they must be under the, God's judgment. That isn't the case. But it certainly seems that at least at a, at a popular a theology level, people did seem to think that. And Hannah in this moment seems to have that going on. We know that even in scripture, just because you can't conceive doesn't mean that you're being judged by God. Sarah and Abraham are unable to conceive. Sarah is not under God's judgment. God actually promises them they're going to have a child and they have to trust and, and, and wait on him. But you can see there that there's a picture where just because you can't conceive has, it doesn't mean that you're under sin or something else like that. Barrenness does not equal judgment. You can't apply it to every case, but it does seem that Hannah was struggling with this type of idea. Hannah and Sarah are both precursors to show that God can make a life out of nothing. They're not mentioned as judgment, but to show that God is really the one who can make a life. And as a way of showing that God intervenes and brings life. He doesn't just leave people. In order for that to happen, though, God's people must turn to him, seek him, trust him, and depend on him and pray to him. One of the pictures that we see throughout scripture is this picture of life and bearing good fruit, like plants. One picture we see is in Psalm chapter 1, where the psalmist writes, Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of, that the sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. The picture here that we are given is that God's people, those who choose to delight themselves in God, in his ways, in spending time in his word, coming to him, depending on him, that they are like trees planted by streams of water, and they bear fruit in their season. Their leaves do not wither. But the psalmist carries on saying, not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. You know, Jesus, he picks up on this kind of imagery of bearing fruit. In John chapter 15, where he says, remain in me and I also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Jesus goes on to say that, listen, when you abide in me and you bear good fruit, it actually shows that you are one of my disciples. You're one of my disciples. See, the call for God's people is to abide in him so that we would experience his life 
in us. And out of that, we would see the love, the truth, the grace, the compassion, the mercy that goes with God's very character that comes from him. And here's why all of this matters. Israel, at this moment, is in a state of spiritual decline, of moral decline. They are God's people. God made a covenant with them, but they have broken that covenant and actually been walking away with God. And we know that this situation that Hannah is in, it, this time period is actually situated right around the end of the book of Judges. And at the end of the book of Judges, we are told this, that every person did what was right in their own eyes. Meaning they weren't doing what was right in God's eyes. They just decided for themselves what, what was right and they did it. And out of that place, there was injustice everywhere where Women were being uh, abused and mistreated, where uh, the Levites, who were supposed to be God's priests, were a, a number of them weren't being faithful to their Levitical vows. They were just abandoning their, their posts. Idolatry was rife. Uh, Israel was being uh, defeated and, and dealing with the Philistines constantly. Wherever you looked, there was this issue. Even in our story here, Eli's sons, Eli's the priest, he's got two sons who are also priests, Hophni and Phineas, we are later on told that they are worthless men because they had actually rejected the leaders, the spiritual leadership mantle that they were supposed to take on from their father by living a life totally contrary to the ways of God. And they're actually going to lose that. They're not going to be leaders. They won't last. This is the state that Israel was in at this time. Israel is actually just as barren as Hannah. Israel is just as barren as Hannah because they haven't actually turned to God and sought him. They've walked away from him. But God does not abandon his people even in that place. See, while Israel had done that and chosen that, Hannah had not chosen that. Hannah is different. She's going to be a picture, a, a paradigm for what Israel needs to do and, and change in their life. See, Hannah goes to God in her grief. That's what we see. If you, if you read on, in verse 9, we see this. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli was a priest sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace and make, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And she went on her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Hannah does not ignore her grief or her anguish. She doesn't cover her losses. Instead, what she does is she acknowledges them and then she brings them to God. She acknowledges her pain. Every single one of us, you mean we, we all experience losses. Some are significant, some are insignificant, natural losses, they get called, right? The significant ones are a loss of a spouse or a child, you know, uh, an untreatable illness, learning that a moral, that a, a leader that you looked up to was morally corrupt. You know, these are all pictures and situations of just devastating loss. But then there's the natural losses that we experience. A change in our life stage, a change in career, or some of our friends moving out of our city, or, or, or you know, our kids going to kindergarten and they're moving out of our house. These are natural things, but they're still losses. And we need to deal with them. We need to acknowledge them. We can't just cover them up and act like they don't affect you. See, grief, acknowledging our, our, our suffering, our feelings, and actually bringing it to God 
is a vital thing to our spiritual formation. When we do this, we can grow to become more compassionate and gracious like Jesus. This is why Jerry Sitzer, he wrote a book called A Grief of Observed. He wrote it because he lost his wife, his mother, and his four-year-old daughter in a tragic car accident. And he said, loss, suffering, it it will transform us or destroy us, but it will never leave us the same. It will transform us or destroy us, but it will never leave us the same. And what you and I have to decide is how we're going to deal with it, because we can try to cover it up, but it doesn't mean it's not there. What Hannah does is she chooses to actually bring her grief and her anguish to God in prayer. Sitzer goes on to say, however painful, sorrow is good for the soul. The soul is elastic like a balloon. It can grow larger through suffering. The question is, how are you and I going to deal with our pain, with our suffering? Hannah chooses to bring it to the Lord. And she prays, look on your servant's misery. She doesn't sugarcoat it. Oh God, I'm kind of struggling. I'm she says, look on my misery and remember me. Do not forget your servant, but give her a son. You see me, God. I know you do. You hear me. Do not forget me. You were able to give me a child, a son. She brings her grief and her pain to God. And then she asks him, give me a son. She prays and puts the weight of her pain and her desires on the only one in the universe who can actually bear the weight of it, God himself, Yahweh. He's the one who can deliver her. And she has good reason to put her trust in him. We're given two hints towards this in our passage. The first one is in her husband's name. It's a proleptic name, meaning there's a hint there. Alcana could be translated as God has created. God has created a son. It's pointing us to the fact that God is going to do something for Hannah and by extension Israel. Because God's not going to leave Israel in their state of spiritual decline of walking away from him. He's actually already beginning to do something and he's using Hannah and her prayer to do that. The second one that we're given though is in who she calls God. Depending on your translation in the NIV, it'll say Lord Almighty. In the ESV and other translations, it'll say Lord of hosts. This is not a common name used to refer to the God of Israel, Yahweh. But scholars believe that it's either referring to here uh, hosts as in like stars or like the heaven realm, like angels or both. As far as I can tell, she seems to be saying, you are the Lord who has created the seen and the unseen realm and you are the king over it all. And you're the one I'm calling on, the creator. Now, one author, he noted this, it was first used when God was about to make a fresh display of his power and grace to his people under their anointed king. Hannah believes that the one who created everything, the seen and the unseen, he can create a life in her. That though she is bearing, he sees her, he hears her, he cares for her, he sustains her, and he can answer her prayer. Then she does something really interesting. It seems like she's making a bargain. If you give me a son, I promise you I'll give him to you. What's going on here? Well, we need to understand the broader context of what's going on. Elkanah, her husband, was a Levite. He actually was supposed to be having these Levitical duties of sacrificing to the Lord, being one of the priests. Only Levites among all the 12 tribes of Israel were supposed to be priests. This wasn't something that the tribe of Benjamin or another one could choose to do. It was only the Levites. And so what she's doing is saying, hey, if you give me a son, if you give me a son, God, I will give him to you because that's what I'm supposed to do. I know that I won't keep him for myself. I will surrender him to you. And so she does that. She prays that. That's what's going on here. It seems like Elkanah, wasn't, wasn't totally being faithful to the vows that he was supposed to be fulfilling. Early the next morning, in verse 19, we read, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. 
So in course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Samuel's name in Hebrew literally means God hears. Samuel, her son, was this picture, not just visually, but by, by name, that God hears. And every time she would say his name, she would be reminded, Yahweh hears me. He doesn't forget me. He answers my prayers. He hears me. He cares. He is the one who brings life out of nothing. What a powerful, powerful reminder she would regularly have. If you keep reading in verse 21, when her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah did not grow. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at the home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After she, he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an epoch of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am a woman. I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord, where his whole life will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah experienced the faithfulness of God. God answering her prayer to give her a son. And what does she do? She doesn't forget the vow she made, the promise. She, she brings him, when he's weaned, to the temple and surrenders her son. She surrenders her son. And Samuel, he starts off as this little kid in the temple with Eli. But God is going to use little Samuel to be central and the Lord bringing about his purposes and his people, of having them turn to God and seek him, having them humble themselves and call on his name. Because you see, he's going to be the one who hears God's voice when no one else is hearing God's voice because they're not really even walking with God or seeking him. Then he's going to replace Eli's two sons as the next prophet and priest and leader for God's people. And he's going to be the one who anoints Israel's first two kings, Saul and King David. God is going to use this boy that Hannah prayed for in her barrenness, in her desperation, to actually bring about a larger movement of bringing life to his people because they are barren themselves and have walked away from him. God doesn't abandon us in our valleys. He's with us and he cares. And he uses Hannah's faithfulness and surrender to bless not just her, but his people. In first, in Second Chronicles chapter 7, God has a word for Solomon, who has just built the temple and dedicated it to the Lord. And he says this to Solomon, and I think it's applicable here. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God is saying, look, if my people turn from their own ways and actually seek me, delight themselves in me, I will hear them. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. I will heal their land. Man, what a powerful picture. You know, we see Samuel in first uh, in first Samuel chapter seven. We're actually gonna we're gonna see him lead Israel in calling out to God in humility, not looking at God as a genie who sprinkles his blessing on them but actually saying, calling them to humble themselves and pray, to call on God to help them as the Philistines continue to attack. And it isn't their, their military might that brings them victory. It's actually God's intervention, his power that delivers them 
and victory. This is what God wants to do for his people. He wants to be the one they depend on, the one that they delight in, the one that they look to and seek out. And, you know, I don't know if, if at this point, you know, you see any similarities between yourself and either Israel or, or Hannah, but let me just ask you this. Is your life at this moment marked by prayerlessness? Maybe you just don't really pray at all or very much, and it doesn't really bother you or grieve you. Maybe you're not really even grieved by sin in general. Your, your, your heart, you don't have a desire to actually come to Jesus and spend time with him or actually to share Jesus with other people. And that also doesn't really bother you. You don't want to spend time in his word. You don't want to spend time studying or knowing the story of the Bible. And none of that bothers you. If, if there's any of that going on, I would say that we're actually trending towards this barrenness. But you know what? Here's what you need to know. If that is you right now, God doesn't want to leave you there. And he hasn't. And the way we know that is that just like Hannah surrendered her son, God surrendered his son, Jesus, and sent him into the world so that no one would perish, but that all would have life. So that we could be like those trees planted by streams of water. And the way that God did that is that Jesus lived the life we were supposed to live. He was faithful. And Jesus went up on a tree. But on his tree, he died and he surrendered his spirit. He said, Father, into your hands, I surrender my spirit. And it's there that Jesus on the cross also experienced the barrenness that is ours because of our sin. All have fallen short of the glorious standard of God. Everyone has sinned. Jesus on the cross took on the barrenness of our sin and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I, when we put our trust in him, can actually experience the presence of God in our valley. So that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we experience God with us and we can say, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Jesus was barren so that we could have fullness of God in our valley. Jesus surrendered his life so that we could have his life in us. This is what you and I actually remember and celebrate in communion. That Jesus died so that we could be made alive. That Jesus took on our sins so that we could actually have his holiness and righteousness. So that when we're walking and we're crying out like Hannah, the God the Father sees Jesus' holiness and righteousness on us. In communion, we celebrate that and we also anticipate that there will be a day where Jesus reconciles and restores everything because all authority has been given to him. So sin, Satan, death, evil, suffering, none of those things have the same place in our world anymore because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. None of them do anymore. Jesus has authority over all of it. And when he returns, he will make all things right. When he returns, there will be no tears. He will wipe away every tear. So we're going to pray right now for the bread and for the juice. I encourage you to prepare those two things. And we're going to give thanks and feast with God. Father in heaven, I give you thanks for your son, Jesus, for the gift of his life. I thank you that Jesus was broken so that we could be made whole and one with you. That we could be reconciled to you. And as we take this bread now, we want to meet with you and feast with you. And Lord, as we take this cup, the juice, we are reminded that Jesus bled on our behalf. He bled in our place so that we could experience his life in us, so that we could be washed clean of all of our sin and shame. And we also know that he will return and make all things right. And so right now we drink in celebration and in anticipation of what Jesus, our King, will do when he returns. And we thank you, God, for the promise of your presence, for the story we have in Scripture of a God who never abandons us but is always with us.
It greatly seems to be in memory. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. It's so good to worship with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Uh, Go into this week with God's peace. We'll see you next time.